Hello and welcome to the Spectro Scientific Webinar. My name is Rich and I'm a Senior Manager with IHS and I'd like to review a few housekeeping items with you before we begin. Let's just take a moment to familiarize ourselves with the operation of the user interface for today's webinar. Now the large window that you're viewing with the heading Spectro Scientific Presentation in the upper left, that's the primary window for today's webinar. You should be seeing the welcome slide there right now. Now if you look to the right of that main presentation window, you'll see the speaker's bio window with background information on today's presenter, Dan Walsh. Now just below that, there's a Q&A window. And at any time during the presentation, you can enter a question into the box in the lower section of that window and click Submit. Your question will then be placed in the queue for Dan to address when we get to that Q&A session. Now if you look to the bottom of your screen, you'll see additional buttons to enhance your webinar experience. To see what a particular button does, just place your mouse pointer over it and a tooltip will appear with a description of that button's function. Okay, and now to get this webinar started, here's the Director of Product Management, Dan Walsh. Dan? Hello. My name is Dan Walsh, the Director of Product Management here at Spectro Scientific. And I'd like to welcome everybody to our webinar, which is titled Lubricant Contamination Control with Portable Analysis Tools. And what we're going to be discussing here for the next 50 minutes or so is some practical approaches to for fleet and industrial plant maintainers regarding getting a handle on lubricant contamination using the latest on-site portable tools. We will discuss what contamination is, what the challenges are out there, and what the practical approaches are to solving those problems with a series of some case studies of industries and, in, and fleets who are taking advantage of these latest technologies and getting very good return of investment. Before I begin talking about lubricant contamination control, I'd like to uh, just give those of you who are new to our webinar an overview of who we are here at Spectro Scientific. We are the um, premier company involved with trending machinery wear and developing the technologies to do that. We've been around for 30 plus years and we're most widely known for being the providers of the Spectral M rotating disc spectrometer that is the de facto standard for the United States Department of Defense JOP program for maintaining all of their assets um, by tracking it with oil analysis and we have the primary tool we supply that um, we have a very strong um, team of people uh, in our company we have a strong heritage in the business we specialize in this condition monitoring um, oil analysis technologies and tools we lead the industry in developing new methodologies and new patents. We have a robust portfolio of over 50 patents related to oil analysis. Um, we are active in the ASTM standards communities. And from a technology perspective, what we really focus on is getting a handle on fluids with, and getting a handle on the instrumentation to test those fluids. Let's talk a little bit about the environment that maintainers are working with today. A great starting point is to talk about the most common maintenance and reliability strategies that everybody is involved with. Um, we all know about reactive run to failure. Um, that is essentially a program where we let something fail and then we do something about it. But best in class organizations throughout the world are looking to go to a predictive or proactive maintenance strategy for their most sensitive equipment, particularly those that is of greatest cost if it breaks down. Why are they doing this? Well, it's fairly simple. It's all about lowering costs. It's well known that if you move to a predictive program and you get a jump on failure, before it occurs or be able to nurse it when it's occurring, you can significantly reduce your costs of failure by planning ahead, by putting your time in, by catching a failure and having avoided downtime. And as you can see here from one of our little graphics, um, it, 
in the process industries, you can see that you can have at least an 8% improvement in terms of cost of sales, maintenance as a percentage of sales, um, by using a predictive approach versus a reactive approach. So with that in mind, where's a great place to start if you are in a fleet maintainer or an industry? Well, we suggest oil analysis because it's integral to every part of a maintenance, particularly with oil wetter components throughout your industry. It's very powerful. It's a fairly easy technology to get involved with. It gives indications of system wear long before vibration starts to kick in. You can catch system contamination and lubricant chemistry problems before damage occurs. And in addition to that, it supports root cause diagnostics or determinations when a problem is occurring. And it, you can also, of course, extend drain intervals and practical maintenance costs, reducing those. It's a great tool for maintenance strategies because it's a measurement tool. And you can't manage a maintenance strategy unless you can measure it or put some metrics to it. And your oil analysis program is a great way of doing that. The other powerful feature about oil analysis is that it does provide practical information over a wide variety of, of aspects to a machinery health. It looks at being able to detect abnormal wear, which is related to the machine condition. It detects chemistry degradation issues, which can, of course, impact the performance of the equipment. And last but not least, it also is a way of eliminating the contamination that can get into a system and cause some damage. And of course, contamination of lubricants is what the practical focus of our uh, presentation is here today. And so we're going to focus more on that. Oil analysis provides a huge amount of data. On any typical oil analysis report that you could get from a lab, you can get anywhere from 30 to 60 individual points of data, depending on what type of test that you're doing. But what you're really trying to do with all that data is you're trying to answer a couple of key reliability questions. And from an oil analysis perspective, the questions that you're focused on are, have I got the right oil present? Is it dry? Is it clean? Is it still fit for further use? And is the machine in okay condition? Do I need to do anything? And the reason you want to ask and those questions is that you're looking to get answers from those questions. And if you have any action items, some of the actions that you can take immediately at that point of use, if you will, or as soon as you sample the oil, are things that can impact your maintenance program immediately. So some of the things don't look too very too, too 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 dramatic, but they have a dramatic effect on the performance of the equipment. So immediate action might be change out a filter if you get a lot of debris getting in there. It might be to dry off the oil using a electrostatic uh, precipitator or a dehydrator or, or using uh, coalescing filters. You might want to change the oil if it's the wrong oil that's present in there. It's sure nice to know that as soon as you identify, as soon as you put the oil in the system or not long after it gets in there, rather than waiting until something occur failure occurs. And if you do identify a severe wear problem, by actually finding it and being able to trend it, you can nurse that problem until such time as you may have the components in place or you've got the labor in place to be able to perform the action. So that's the practical side of oil analysis. It has a real everyday immediate benefit to the entire maintenance team that you have at your fleet location or at your plant site. We mentioned that the webinar is going to focus on lubricant contamination. What is lubricant contamination? Well, we look at lubricant contamination as a series of potential items that can cause damage and get into the oil. It might be solid contamination due to sand and dirt getting into the system, due to wear debris that's generated in the system, either by a incorrect component or by, a, by dirt getting in and causing abrasion. It could be soot content particles causing abrasive problems. It can be liquid contamination, water, coolant, fuel, glycol, all of these issues. It can be 
not so common, but it can be gas in the process industries. If you have too much air in your oil, you know you're going to get excessive foaming, which leads to excessive heat, which leads to problems in terms of, of degradation of the oil. It could be so that you're getting process gases in there. If you have a refrigeration compressor and it's not performing, you have too much ref refrigerant present. All of those issues there. And of course, another overlooked area is thermal contamination, where essentially you have too much heat in the system and the oil is being degraded as a result of that. All of these issues can, are, are considered to be lubricant contamination. And what we're going to do in the next few slides is talk about the major, most common contaminants that are present. But it's really, really important to see that if you tackle lubricant contamination, you can have a direct effect on your bottom line. It is the best way for anybody who's considering an on-site oil analysis program to to start. Why? Because you can see real tangible benefits and a return of your investment in the shortest possible time. And this is borne out by other industries, not just us saying it. Um, a really interesting study from SKF a few years ago looked at the premature bearing failure and they identified that contamination and poor lubrication almost counts, accounts for half of the, most co of the failures for premature bearings. And they noticed as well that your total maintenance budget is majorly impacted by these premature bearing failures. I want everyone to notice as well, though, that even though we talk about extending drain intervals, lubricant costs alone are not going to give you the return of investment that you need for an on-site program or a contamination control program. They're expensive, but they're only a fraction of the overall costs. The real costs in your maintenance program as a result of premature failures that could be related to oil analysis or others is the cost of components, the cost of labor, the cost of overtime labor to fix these issues, and the resulting support networks to carry those things out. That is the cost that you can try and avoid by having a predictive program and oil analysis is an integral part of that. Let's go to the most common types of contamination. When we talk about solid contamination, what are we referring to here? Well, solid contamination is essentially particles that get into the oil. They can get in there in a couple of different ways. The most common is sand and dirt getting in, which could lead to abrasive wear, free body damage, and cause wear debris. You could also have debris that's generated as a result of corrosion. In the case of degraded oil causing wear or contamination getting in that way, or of course, soot contamination. Key takeaway here is that 70% of equipment downtime is due to some form of surface degradation due to corrosion and wear particulate. So as a result of that, it's oftentimes the first point of contact for people who are looking to st establish a contamination control program. And in fact, if you look around the industry, many, many OEMs and service companies talk about contamination control programs. Many of the major uh, mining equipment customers and fleets have a contamination program. Many of the turbine companies operate a contamination control program. And what that's really focused on is controlling that level of solid contamination that's getting into the system. When they talk about solid contamination, one of the overarching measurement approaches is particle counting. Particle counting has been around now for almost 40, 50 years, originally aimed at hydraulic cleanliness, and still a lot of the system is aimed at clean systems. But essentially, it's a measure of the entire cleanliness of a fluid. When we talk about particle counting, it's a way of measuring all the particles in the fluid, regardless of composition and shape, looks at all the sizes, and it bins them according to size and quantity. And then what it does is the technologies of, there's a series of contamination patterns from ISO, NAS, ASTM, um, and a variety of international standards as well. And these codes are frequently referred to for any 
manufacturer who is providing a clean system. It also is a tool for filter manufacturers to be able to design and sell filters to be able to meet a certain contamination level. From your perspective, you want to control contamination. A, an inverse or a, a variation of a McPherson curve is shown here, which essentially is, is that depending on the cleanliness of a system, the cleaner you can get it, the greater you can extend the life of the equipment. And you can see that, that depending on the application, particularly with hydraulic systems and bearings and turbines, which have very tight tolerances and servo valves, if you can control the contamination much more critically in those applications than in others, you're going to get a much greater increase in the life of the equipment. So particle counting of some sort is essential, especially when you're dealing with rotating machinery and anytime you've got clean systems, hydraulic systems, anything that relies on fluid power does need to have a contamination control program. Another common problem that we see is water contamination. Water contamination is particularly a challenge because water can coexist in oil. Water is Oil is hydroscopic, which essentially means that if you leave an open bottle of oil out to the atmosphere, the moisture in the atmosphere will be absorbed into the oil as a result of weak electrostatic attraction, and it will absorb moisture up to its saturation level. Above that point, if water is still present in the environment, it will come out as free water. Well, we don't want water in oil. We want to control it. We want to keep it as dry as possible because we know that if we have water in the oil, it will cause premature wear. It will cause, in some situations, loss of viscosity, loss of, 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 of capability of the system, not able to carry the load, excessive heat, a variety of issues can occur. And again, there's many, many manufacturers, bearing companies, uh, equipment companies all tell you, keep the water out of control. Funnily enough, even water getting into a brand new drum can have serious side effects because those additives can get attracted by the and damaged by reaction with water and of course can be destroyed. Philips 66 makes it quite clear in their product manual, you know, keep the water out of the system because it will destroy the additives before you have a chance to actually use the oil. So if you see a watery oil, you definitely want to do something about it before you actually put it into a system. Preferably you want to feed and bleed it. Another common liquid contaminant that is more specifically aimed at on, uh, engines that are liquid fired, that is liquid fired meaning diesel or gasoline or distillate fuel, unburned fuel can enter the crankcase causing problems. Usually there's always a certain amount of fuel that's getting in at any one time. It gets evaporated off due to the normal heat that's present in the engine. But if you have a defective rings or seals, or you have injector faults, or improper air fuel ratios, or you have clogged air filters, excessive idling, all of this can cause more fuel getting into the crankcase than was originally planned for. Once you get over 2%, you need to monitor it. Reason is that it essentially thins out the viscosity, it can mix with the lubricant, it can lower the, lo the load bearing characteristics and the anti wear capabilities of the oil. It, um, it also washes the lubricant off of the critical wearing parts. So it's like essentially putting your engine into a degreaser and then going off and running it. Would you prefer to have metal on metal contact? It's never a good idea, so excessive wear and seizure can happen. In worst case scenarios, if there's a severe fuel problem, engines can catch on fire and have an explosive event. Is it a common issue? Well, depends on who you talk to. About 14% of 300,000 samples that a major lab here in the U.S. looked at um, on a study a few years ago came back with excessive levels of fuel dilution. And many of the railroads who run thousands of engines absolutely have to have some sort of fuel dilution because in their world, fuel dilution, if, it, if it's left unattended to, can cause a severe failure in the worst possible situation. 
So it is something that we need to worry about. Soot contamination is a variant on, a, on solid contamination. It's typically from the combustion process um, as a result of blow-by um, uh, air fuel ratio problems. And you can have a significant amount of soot in the oil. It can be fully dissolved in the oil, but it can also be, depending on the, bur on the application, you can actually have abrasive particles of soot forming. And um, it's related to poor combustion. Um, your viscosity will, thick will increase as a result of the thickening up. You can have sludge formation if you've got a lot of water present in the engine as well. You can have excessive wear showing up on the rocker arms, valve covers, oil pans all get slicked up. And soot problems are not solved with an oil change. That is to say, you can change the oil and that will buy you some time, but the soot problem can, will, will occur continuously and you have to do something with the engine control system. Either change out the filter, change your air fuel ratio, look at the burn cycle to get that performance just right. And in many countries, US and in Europe, you really do not want to be going around with huge smokestacks, especially if you're a fleet operator. And any of you who see that type of application on a highway or a motorway, you know that that driver or that truck has got problems if you see black smoke coming out because that's such unburned carbon. Varnish and sludge is a byproduct of oil degradation in contact with um, a series of acids, um, byproducts of the oil, depending on the temperature and the environment. Um, it's, a, it's a problem. It's a common problem in a lot of areas. Transformers are, um, can have these issues. A lot of uh, engine systems have them. You can have it on poorly operating compressor applications. There's been a huge amount of discussion and solutions around the turbine industry for the last several years, where there's very specific conditions, usually where your oil is overheated or there's an opportunity for it to be overheated as a result of spark dissipation present in the oil. And that can lead to sludge deposits and varnish deposits, which are incredibly difficult to, to get rid of. And continuous monitoring is critical. If you're starting to see oil degrade, um, if you're doing a, ru a routine track, that's an indication that you could have problems in a clean system. Initial trending may not be the only thing you need. You may look to, need to look at additive levels as well, using ruler systems and things like that, but certainly, the technologies out there for tracking it are, are, are quite popular. Glycol contamination is another liquid contamination that we need to worry about. Um, antifreeze, again, mostly in an engine application, although there is a lot of rotating equipment, which also has glycol cooling systems. What we're worried about there is when the cooling system has integrity issues. There's only a few issues that can occur. Typically, you get gaskets or seal failure, like a head gasket problem. You can get piping or valve issues where there's a, there's a degradation in the lines. Or you can get radiator or heat exchanger corrosion issues. Whatever it is, if you get contamination in there, glycol is a particularly nasty contaminant in oil. A little bit of oil in there combined with water can cause a severe wear problem. It's well known in the research labs that when you want to actively degrade an engine or a bearing surface, add some glycol in there because the combination of water and glycol will aggressively attack the surfaces very, very rapidly. Um, you can cause a series of problems. It forms acids issues. It, 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 it attacks the additives in the oil. So overall, you want to reduce it and keep it under control. And in the last few years, many of the OEMs and folks who really have large engine fleets have really started to beef up their capability of looking at coolant analysis on the coolant side of the business because they're saying that when coolants start to degrade, especially with the new technologies, they can affect the entire engine performance. From our side, we're worried about what happens when coolant gets into the oil. And how common is it? Well, depends on who you talk to, but anywhere from 8 to 17% 
of engines, depending on studies, have had coolant contamination in there. So when you do have that, you need to reduce that. Usually when you have coolant in there, you may also have a water problem. So of course you have a bunch of things developing. So it's important that you track that if you're an engine, manuf an engine maintainer. So what are the challenges at the moment for contamination? Well, most people still send their oil samples out to labs. It's the most common methodology. They are use their oil supplier or they use an independent lab. And the problem is, is that contamination events such as we just described don't wait for the lab results. They're going to continue to occur all the time. And the challenge right now is that the end user, the maintainer, can actually detect most of these problems that we just described using current technologies that are on the marketplace and be able to detect them at the point of use right on the machine level. If they can detect it right there, they can get actionable information and head off the problem before it gets to be a big issue. So the quicker you have the information, the better your contamination program control program is going to be. Most oil analysis is tested by off-site labs and there's huge difficulty with turnaround time, results don't get in in time, there could be multiple weeks delays. Some of this is not the lab's problem. It could be a huge logistics nightmare just getting it out of your building, never mind getting it into the lab. So the combination of these issues means that the effectiveness of these oil analysis programs is just not where it needs to be. And oil analysis as a tool overall is suffering a bad a bad name or a bad reputation because people who need to have this information just can't get it. And so what we're saying is take a look at all analysis again, but look about bringing it in-house using the latest technologies because then you can go back, revise your program, and the nice thing about it is, is that you can have instant information that you can translate into decisive maintenance actions there and then. And it's a very powerful tool, particularly when you're tracking your return on investment. This fits in very much with our vision. I mentioned at the top of the presentation that we've been involved with providing instrumentation for the military and on commercial labs for many, many years. And we realized several years ago that there's a limitation of what happens there. There is a lot of samples being tested out there, but despite that, there are only in our world 10% of the possible oil samples are being actually tested. 10% of the possible equipment that should be tested is only is being tested. And even then, it's not being tested as well as it should be. So and from our business, if we can take the lab instrumentation, make it as easy as possible to use, and get it into the hands of the operator, then oil analysis as a technology becomes extremely relevant and viable and a real cost saver to the industry and to fleet maintainers. And that's our mission. Our mission is to deliver that type of technology. And how we've started to that is we have developed a series of technology tools that are both portable and benchtop, but collectively together you can mix and match them and come up with a complete picture for lubricant condition monitoring contamination condition monitoring, and machine condition monitoring. The key takeaway is that if you start with contamination control as your, as your starting point, some of the initial portable technologies will have great appeal to you. For if you're an engine owner, right now, if you have a series of portable tools such as oxidation fluid scan, or a fuel dilution meter, or viscometer, you are in a position to be able to detect problems very, very quickly. A great example of that right now is if you are a generator, portable generator owner and you are requiring to meet extended drain intervals per the EPA NESHAP rules, you can see that portable equipment can extend your drain intervals by just uh, taking advantage of looking at acid or base number, looking at the water content, looking at viscosity. So there's a variety of tools out there where if you can manage those, you get those tools, you can manage the lubricant contamination that gets into the engine, and if you can manage that, you can reduce your wear events, and in addition to that, you can increase the reliability of the systems. 
Similarly, for rotating equipment owners where particle count leads the way for solid contamination, we talked about clean systems, you want to lead off with a technology such as the LaserNet Fine series, which actually has a lot of information by way of particle counting, ISO 4406, as well as solid particulates. You can also pair that with viscometer and infrared condition systems and get a good picture of all the liquid and solid contaminants that could be present in your system. You always expand off of these type of things by adding in some of the more traditional technologies such as rotating spectroscopy, uh, rotating disk electrode spectroscopy for wear metals analysis. You can also add in expeditionary tools. You can add in a variety of different technologies as needed. The nice thing about these things is that you can pick what you need or get a set and it can grow as you grow. You, can, you don't need to have a full lab all at once. You can pick up what you need and start acquiring that and start hitting that contamination control immediately. So we have a series of solutions, and we urge you to investigate this a little further, depending on your particular need. If it's wear debris, sand and dirt contamination, varnish, fuel dilution, soot, glycol, water, we have different technologies out there that will be able to detect in both a lab or a workbench environment, as well as that can be also looked at in the field. And they have the same capabilities and lab grade accuracy for the field tools similar to what you'd expect in a lab. So let's go with some success stories. An example right there of just catching water was with the Coast Guard. They had a water ingression problem where they had a 3,000 gallon oil tank on board their ship. They suspected water. They had a portable tool, the fluid scan. They detected the water by checking the system there and then. Before it left port, they were able to solve that problem fix the water leak and avoid a major oil change. The oil was dewatered before things got out of control. If they had waited for the oil analysis report, they would have been out to sea. If they were out to sea, they would have to call off the mission and come back in for a repair. And they estimated that at the time they did that and actually having to replace the oil because the water would have by then damaged it beyond repair, it would have cost them $50,000. So it's right there, one incident, right? Single incident, they were able to actually justify their entire program. Another example of a success story of people who've done this is a Western refinery. They had a premature failure problem with several of their charge pumps. Charge pump is a common system that's used in refineries, particularly for their machinery process trains, for their fluids. Um, very critical equipment. They acquired a Q200. They looked at it from a particular issue. They said, let's start tracking the particle analysis. They noticed very straight away that they had a series of sliding wear particles being shown up on the routine counts. They looked at a particle count increasing and they looked at the type of wear or the type of particle that was causing the count. They could do that with this tool. And they saw straight away that they had a series of sliding wear particles. Immediately, with that information, they were able to go to the millwrights that were right there in the refinery, bring them this information, and all of a sudden a light bulb went off with the millwrights and said, oh, I understand what the problem was. Straight away, they were able to avoid a huge amount of problems. Just a couple of those cases, they identified that they went and extended their drain intervals because they wouldn't change an oil out prematurely for no reason. And... They were also able to keep the system, the refinery, uptime values in a dramatic way. This refinery did so good that they won an award from the Noria magazine for this year for most improved lubrication program. It was the John Battle Award. So take a look at it in some of the publications. A common story is railroads. The fuel challenge dilution is a common problem. They like to have a portable tool that they can have right at the truck, at the rail stop, that when the train comes in and they check the oil and they check the fuel, they can immediately look at the fuel. If they have a fuel dilution problem, that is a first sign that there's an injector problem or a, a rocker problem, and they will take that engine out of service as soon as they can. 
having that information right there and then and tracking it is extremely powerful for them to keep up their application. Union Pacific is one of the railroads that use it. They have over 10,000 engines. It's the largest railroad in the U.S. Uh, freight railroads has been around for 150 years, and they rely on this type of technology on a daily basis. Another success, success story is a treatment plant that could be applied for an industrial customer. In this situation, they were changing all unnecessary. So they weren't necessarily looking at a contamination problem, but they, once they started doing it, they saw straight away that when they started doing it, they caught a series of problems, you, routine issues, housekeeping issues, mix-ups. And so by using the portable technology, they were able to save $25,000 in the first year by just doing some basic checks right there and then. So you can see that all this type of application works, and it works well. The key takeaway nowadays with the portable tools is that they can reduce your existing costs. You're not investing just to bring in your costs or raise your program costs. You're maintaining your reliability or asset capability that you currently have. In most situations, you'll increase your asset availability or uptime, but most importantly, you're gonna reduce your costs. So when you present this, this is what you need to get aground. The advantage is that in addition, that portable tools can touch all equipment in your organization, not just the critical equipment, but those essential and important and maybe the stuff you only look at now and again. That is very important to be able to look at that. And so this helps also to justify the cost and the investment. Overall, you can attack it there and then, find a solution, solve the problem. To find out more information about these technologies, visit our website. We've got white papers, case studies, and references there for you. Um, well, I urge you to investigate that and call our call our uh, our contacts uh, worldwide. Our, our look at our distributor list, look at some of our salespeople, and they can give you additional case studies and customers who've been using our technology and have got great benefit from it. With that, I'm going to close the presentation and go to frequently asked questions. Thank you. Dan, thank you for your insight into the benefits of on-site oil analysis and some of the parameters that maintenance and engineering personnel should consider when monitoring the health of their valuable assets. And now, let's go to the Q&A portion of the session. So first question, what would be the recommended minimum testing for a wide range of oil? Thank you, John. Um, I think maybe what the, uh, the, the, the person who's asking the question may be asking is what are the minimum set of tests for a wide range of, of, uh, of uh, maybe lubrication oils? Um, assuming that these oils are just a general across-the-board oils, I think uh, what most people agree with is viscosity as a, as a very bare minimum check to see if the product is meeting the guidelines that you have for your product sheet. Viscosity is a starting point. Um, it, it, that is really more of a product quality uh, issue. Um, if you're talking about contamination, I think um, you might want to be considering some technology or tools that will be looking at the most common contamination issues that we had shown earlier in the presentation. Uh, if, you're, if your lubricants are going to be used in engine applications, you probably want to look at a tool such as a fluid scan that can give you a variety of the ox uh, lubricant degradation and typical contamination patterns that you see on there. If you're dealing with rotating equipment, you probably want to go more towards the solid contamination. Okay, thank you. Um, next question has to do with, uh, with particles. Is there some type of field or lab instrument that can be used for particle counting? If so, what method would this be using? And is there some type of instrument that may do multiple tests that can be done either in the field or in a laboratory? There are multiple, there, there's a lot of solutions out there for particle counting. Um, 
in addition to that, there are uh, there is equipment as as I kind of had given on the uh, presentation, just equipment that can do more than just particle counting. So the best way to start to do some research on finding out what you need is take a summary of the key pieces of equipment that you have that you're taking care of. Is it mostly uh, in, is this an industrial setting? Um, where you're dealing with mostly gearboxes and hydraulic systems, things like that, um, or is it more towards a fleet? If it's more of an industrial setting with particle counting, what you probably want to do is um, what you probably want to do is look at um, the, the typical types of contamination and uh, 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 root cause of that. I had mentioned in the presentation that. Uh, basic particle counting um, is typically used in hydraulic applications, whereas more advanced particle counting, which uh, starts to look at the level of particulate, looking at the composition and the shape of the particulate, such as this laser net finds technology we, we uh, showed, um, not only gives particle count, but starts to give you some information about where the particles are coming from. So um, in, as you do your research, in short, yes, there's a lot of solutions out there. Some solutions um, not only look at the count, but look at what's causing the count. And so based off of that, you want to start doing your research on what is the most critical um, concerns you have uh, with, with, with particles and what are you trying to achieve by having a contamination program in place. All right, thank you. Um, another question, what would you suggest for equipment for heavy oil, uh, HFO. Okay, so uh, in this situation, I think what the caller is saying is uh, we have an engine application possibly, which is burning heavy fuel oil. Um, very common, uh, used uh, in many marine applications as well as in power applications throughout the world. So in those cases, I think there's uh, 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 two, uh, two, two concerns. One is that if you have an engine that's burning uh, HFO, you generally have a high sulfur content, which means that you're going to have very rapid degradation of the oil. So base number monitoring is critical there. So having a fluid scan technology or something like that that measures base number along with the most common other concerns, oxidation and sulfation degradation issues, you want to be tracking that on a regular basis. You also might want to be checking the um, viscosity. Um, if you have excessive HFO inter entering into the crankcase, it, this is, let's say, if you had a, an application where HFO has an opportunity, like a four-stroke engine, to get in there, you might want to be checking the viscosity to see if there's any variations on that. Um, thirdly, um, you may also want to back that up with some possible, so, so elemental analysis may be where you're looking at levels of vanadium or levels of nickel that might be getting into the oil, which is also evidence of HFO contamination. All right, thank you, Dan. Um, next question, just how portable are these units? Are some of them battery powered? Um, yes, on, on many of these systems that we propose and what's new about fluid analysis nowadays is that many of these technologies are battery powered. They've got batteries already installed on them. They're rechargeable batteries. They can operate with a power supply connected to them. However, you can disconnect the power supply and go and walk around with them to the specific area that your equipment is, is um, operating or close by. So uh, that's the big change is that um, the, many of these two tools here are, are battery operated, specifically for the engine applications, that fluid scan, the fuel dilution meter and the viscometer are all battery operators. Um, for uh, things like the particle counter, that's still considered to be more of a bench top tool and that's still uh, powered uh, by mains. Okay, thank you. Um, do these devices produce a report of its findings or provide a USB connection for a computer interface to upload data? Um, yes, all, every, so it, the, several of these systems have onboard um, interface where, for instance, on, on the fluid scan, you have an onboard um, computer which essentially uh, saves the data on a database. And then almost all these technologies have a 
complementary uh, software, which is loaded on a PC, and then using a standard like USB cable, you can um, synchronize your database and then export that data or look at that data on your PC. Okay. Uh, what are the maintenance requires of requirements of some of the equipment? In other words, filters, cleaning, storage requirements, consumables, things of that nature. That's a great question because uh, you're, you're thinking um, one of the big improvements, shall we say, in the advance of oil analysis technology, and particularly as we talk about bringing it out of the lab and into the field, means that we have to make it a lot easier for the operator to be able to use. And as a result of that, the level of maintenance and the level of consumables necessary are much lower than what you would typically expect in a lab. Um, specifically, in some cases, like that fluid scan, all you need is a drop of oil and a cleaning rag. There's no solvents required. There's no additional chemicals. Um, many of the other devices, you could operate them uh, just introducing just a few drops of fluid, and uh, you either might need a, a, a pipette or some sort of a um, vial in order to be able to achieve your, your, your goals. So, each, so overall, key takeaway is um, little to no solvents involved. Um, most of the time just using a rag to clean them, and in one or two cases you're using a, like a disposable pipette or a disposable vial. Okay, thank you. How much training is needed to correctly use these instruments and to get accurate results? The systems have been designed with the operator in mind as opposed to a lab technician. So with that, the, uh, the interface is, is quite simple. It's uh, generally color-coded. It's uh, uh, icon-based. Um, most of the time, an operator can up, be up and running under 20 minutes, be able to run a, decent, a, a sample. In addition to that, the systems have a lot of built-in capability, such as uh, background correction or calibrations pre-installed, so that it makes it easier for the operator to take the unit and operate it right out of the box. Okay. Uh, does Next question. Does the device check concentration level, in other words, coolant to water? Um, that, uh, no, no. That, what we're referring to here is the solutions that we've had as a subject of this webinar or is everything related to the lubricant side of the business. What I think you're referring to there is if you have a 50-50 solution of glycol to water that you would fit into, into a coolant system, um, that, uh, that, that that's not what the, this subject is. This is only if the coolant leaks into the oil and you want to identify the percentage of coolant that leaked in the actual oil matrix. Okay. What about the uh, expected life of the testing equipment? When or how often will it have to be replaced? Much of this equipment was originally developed with military applications in mind. And when we design or when the equipment is designed for military applications, there's an expected life um, where the system is expected to be operational from a, for a period of typically 10 years. Um, the systems themselves nowadays, relying on solid state technology, very little moving parts, means that you're relying on the, uh, they, they have much greater um, uh, reliability lifetime than what you would have with traditional or older lab equipment, which had a lot of uh, moving parts. Okay, thank you. Uh, what would you suggest for equipment for heavy soot-laden diesel engine oil? Um, I, I would suggest a couple of things. I would certainly suggest what we had said, uh, what I had mentioned earlier when we talked about HFO, which is um, you want to have a tool that is uh, uh, be able to measure a soot content. There is soot is a tough. Uh, tough to measure. Most of the basic uh, control systems, such as the combination fluid scan system, will get you soot up to a certain percentage. If you think that your soot content typically is going to be above 4%, you might want to consider what's called a dedicated soot meter, which will actually track the level of soot that's present in the fluid. However, you also want to be looking at base number, as we mentioned earlier. You want to be looking at water content. You want to be looking at oxidation, nitration, and the sulfation values. 
they all need to be pr uh, checked out as well. Just because it's heavily soot laden um, doesn't mean that those products or those contaminants are not don't have to be checked. Okay, thank you, Dan. Uh, question about the fluid scan: Would the fluid scan handle and TBN, oxidation, nitration, glycol, water, and viscos viscosity? Um, there is a solution out there where you use, the fluid scan will cover, uh, of those items you just mentioned, John, can TBN, everything save the viscosity. The fluid scan is an infrared spectrometer which will cover all of those tools. There is, an, a, there is a, a, a partner product called the viscometer where you run, the, you, you can measure your viscosity with that, but you may input that data into the fluid scan so that the data is all together. Okay, thank you. Um, handling samples is critical, and samples can be contaminated in the handling process. Do these instruments provide a means of getting the sample without the risk of contamination? Oh, that's a great question. Sampling is, 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 the, is you're absolutely right. Sampling is a, is a major problem. Um, one of the great features uh, that these new pro tools provide is the ability to not have to worry about pulling a, a, a sample, a big 120 milliliter sample like you were traditionally doing for oil lab. In the case of the fluid scan and the viscometer, we're only talking about a couple of drops of fluid. In many cases, the operators are just taking literally what the dipstick drops are coming off the system and being able to sample that very quickly. It's important to understand, too, that for the lubricant degradation components, contamination components. You don't need to be, you just need to get that sample of fluid. Um, in the case of particulate, you do need to be much more careful about proper sampling because it's a, uh, to get an accurate representation. So you do need to practice the, the best sampling practices such as um, removing the dead leg off a sampling valve, making sure that the, 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 the sample bottle that you're actually going to um, use has been rinsed out with the fluid that you're actually testing to ensure that you have um, no cross-contamination from a previous sample. Okay, thank you. Uh, when checking oil that may have been diluted, is there an instrument that will tell what was causing the dilution, whether it's water, coolant, or something else? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So the first starting point I would say there is use a tool like the fluid scan, which gives you a wide range of parameters all at once. So if I'm looking at an oil sample and I suspect that there's a dilution problem, but I don't know what it is, I can first of all start to eliminate some issues. For instance, if it's a gearbox I'm dealing with, I know I'm not going to get fuel in there. But I might be concerned about maybe water and glycol. Well, the great news is, is that this uh, fluid scan technology will actually look at water and glycol all together, along with some of the other contaminants that we talked about. So um, the tools are designed to be able to address a wide range of problems all at once. Um, in the case of a fuel application, um, you might want to be, you, you typically will only have one fuel that's firing on a particular system. So um, key takeaway is, the technology allows you to have more than, you, if, you, if you look at a combination of these tools together, you will be able to solve your problem. Okay, thank you, Dan. Uh, next question, how do I build my case for implementing in-house oil analysis? Okay, um, I, that's an important question. Um, we had mentioned in some of our presentation that if you just think about the cost of your oil sample, your oil analysis, or your oil lubricant cost on its own, you, um, you, you won't get a full picture about what's going on. So how we would, how would we do that? Take, take, get a look, look at all your equipment. Take a list of all the equipment that you have and get your maintenance cost, your current maintenance cost. Look at what your effort is at the moment and establish a goal of what you're trying to achieve in terms of cost reduction and reliability improvement. So get those overall metrics going first of all. Then take a look at the most common reasons for, uh, if they've been documented, for why the millwrights or the maintenance people have been changing or fixing equipment. And then concentrate on those acute problems 
and start to build a case for having a non-site program. Okay. Uh, can you provide sort of a very basic uh, pricing of, of some of these devices? Um, that's uh, what I can do there. Is this is that's a great point for to have you follow up with maybe some of our sales teams. So what I can do there is is uh, take your information and provide that over to our sales folks who can give you some more information about budgetary numbers. Okay, great. Uh, when I compare the investment cost of in-house oil analysis to the cost of lab samples and oil changes, I, I can't really justify bringing it on site. How do I know I've covered sort of all the bases here? Um, great, great question. So, so again, as you mentioned earlier, oil co sample costs and oil changes, even though they're considerable, they're only about maybe three to six percent of the total cost of unplanned downtime. So when you're making your case for internal, for ROI, your return of investment, consider the labor that's involved with unplanned downtime, overtime hours, parts, uh, time to, to get everything in there, in addition to the lubricant cost. And once you put that together, you'll find that you'll have a very compelling case to be able to bring it on board and look at your uh, return of investment time. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up here shortly. but. Uh, give you one more question here. Does oil analyzer fluid analysis provide diagnostic testing? Um, I, I, I'm not clear on the question. I think what I want to what I want to say is is that what these tools provide you is the actual result and you have the ability to put alarms in on some of this equipment or the software that accompanies it to be able to tell you if it's good or bad. Traffic light idea. From that, you can start to develop a diagnostic about what needs to go to occur. So these tools provide you the detail and the traffic light, but the diagnostic recommendation is something that's unique to each particular user or industry. All right, thank you. Uh, we're going to have to wrap up this webinar right there, Dan. Um, we'd like to thank Dan Walsh, Director of Product Management, uh, for spending some time with all of us today. And thank you to all of our audience members for being part of this webinar event. To find more information regarding on-site oil analysis, please visit our website at www.spectrosci.com. And as always, feel free to call or email us with any questions or applications you might have. You will be receiving an email from us with a link to the on-demand version of this presentation, where you may also access a PDF of this PowerPoint and a transcript of the question and answer session. Lastly, please take a moment to complete our survey, which will appear on your screen at the end of this webinar. Again, thank you for taking the time to learn more about on-site oil analysis and how a condition-based monitoring program can save time and money on oil analysis and give you the peace of mind knowing your valuable assets are protected. Take care, and we'll talk to you soon.